I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Gavin Schmidt, climatologist, climate modeler, director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and co-founder of the award-winning climate science blog, Real Climate. Dr. Schmidt has a BA in mathematics from Oxford and a PhD in applied mathematics at University College London. His research includes work on the variability of ocean atmosphere circulation models and paleoclimatology, and he helped develop the GISS ocean and coupled GCMS climate models. Dr. Schmidt's awards and honors include being named one of Scientific American's top 50 research leaders of the year in 2004, recognition by the joint award of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, and being awarded the inaugural Climate Communications Prize in 2011. So Gavin, welcome. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you with me today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for that uh, great introduction. It was, it was all good, except for the Nobel Prize bit, which was not really involving me. So, Well, uh, I, I saw you nod, but you know, in, in Wikipedia, where I did research on that, really? that yes, they mentioned your research specifically, and they said that you were part of that. So so it's just oh, yeah. humility. So, somebody's going to have to go, and go in and get that fixed. Um, okay, but uh, anyway, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, you know, it's 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 great to be able to uh, to talk about the things that we do and uh, and the, the the scope of, well, of what we're doing. Absolutely, this this is a big topic. I love this one. So we're talking about the Silurian hypothesis, mm -hmm. which is a thought experiment created by yourself and Dr. Adam Frank, which assesses modern science's ability to detect evidence of a prior advanced civilization, perhaps even several million years ago. So again, this is a giant topic, and I absolutely love this. Let me start out by asking, what was the initial inspiration for this? So um, back in the early 2000s, uh, people were very interested, they're still interested, in uh, in, in, in an event uh, in the early Cenozoic. So that's kind of, you know, after the dinosaurs, but quite a long time ago, about 55 million years uh, ago. And, uh, and people were starting to look at the uh, the evidence for a for a very rapid um, and you know pretty surprising uh, jump in temperatures, change to the carbon cycle, and a whole bunch of other things that happened uh, right around 55 million years ago, and uh, that was called uh, the uh, well now it's it's now called the 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 Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. So it comes between uh, the Paleocene era and the the Eocene era. Um, and uh, people were interested in, in, you know, what what could have caused it, what happened, and uh, and the big things that you notice uh, about that event is that there's this very large perturbation to the carbon cycle. So the carbon isotopes like change, you know, very dramatically everywhere in the world. Uh, then there's there's a global warming effect that that happens. Um, there is. Uh, rearrangements of uh, of ecosystems. There are big uh, fluxes of uh, sediment and, uh, and and metals into the ocean. You can see these spikes and all of these different things. And um, and at the time, I, I I kind of really just as a as a joke, I started comparing it to what was happening today. You know, perturbation to the carbon cycle, global warming, um, rearrangements of ecosystems, lots of stuff going into the oceans. And it was like, ha, ha um, what if uh, the causes were the same? Right. So so uh, hypothesizing that, you know, I, that that uh, the, the causes of all the changes that we're seeing now, which is us, uh, you know, you know, was there an equivalent uh, back then? And uh, and this uh, was a, a kind of an after dinner uh kind of uh you know a little thought experiment uh everyone went ha ha ha, ha how funny um and then we moved on right um and so for a while uh you know i'd bring it up every often every so often i'd say well you know isn't it funny that you know these things look the same um and everyone said oh yeah that's very funny uh and then move on um and then uh Coming, coming more recently, um, NASA as a whole, so I work for NASA, uh, NASA as a whole has become much more interested in uh, the notion of techno signatures, 
uh, you know, can we detect um, uh, activities of alien civilizations uh, from afar? Uh, you know, particularly with the James Webb Space Telescope, you know, can we see, you know, telltale signs in, in the atmosphere or in uh, the uh, characteristics of, of, of solar systems or in the emissions of various, uh, various things, you know, can we, can we detect that? Can we detect radio signals uh, from, from nearby planets? Um, and as uh, we've discovered lots more exoplanets, it's suddenly become a very salient thing because like now there are lots of candidate um, uh, planets around that we can look at right or that, that we can that we can target uh, and so uh, I started uh, uh, talking a lot more to uh, to kind of the astrobiologists the astrophysicists uh, who are who are kind of interested in that particular question of how could we detect an alien civilization on another planet and uh, Adam came around uh, Adam Frank came around uh, one day and he said oh I want, I want to talk about this well, you know I want to how could we how, how could we do this and I said well have you thought about how you would detect it on this planet and he kind of stopped short and he said I never even thought of it and uh, and the idea about detection going back in time as well as going out into space uh, really was something that uh, that 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 was new that were that people hadn't really uh, thought about. And when we started diving into it, so I gave him my little toy example, and and you know we started thinking about it more seriously. Um, and the big problem, of course, is that. Uh, you know, the further back you go, the more opaquely you see things, right? So, you know, you have like, you know, for the modern period, we have instruments and, and satellites and we can tell, you know, pretty much exactly what's going on. You know, a few thousand years ago, we have ice cores and tree rings and we can tell what was going on. But, you know, you go back, you go back 10 million years, you go back 50 million years, you go back 150 million years. Uh, our ability to tell what was happening uh, gets gets a lot more obscure uh, and we're not, we you know, we can't can't, we can't see the timing of things. Everything gets squished uh, together. Things that might have happened, you know, thousands of years apart. Like now, you can't tell that that happened. You know, it was like it all seems to happen at one time. Um, and so, uh, and so, as you, as you go further back, you know, it becomes actually quite hard to convince yourself that there are no signals of of uh, of prior civilizations. You know, you you might think. Oh well, you know, we would know. We would know. We would see evidence everywhere, right? You know, we would we would be digging up ancient machines, and we would find an ancient. But it turns out that you know most things just get crushed to dust yeah. uh, after after fifty million years of processes on the Earth's surface. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and it's and it's very hard to um, to look at the fossil record with its massive gaps and very very poor sampling, uh, and and convince yourself that we haven't missed something. Uh, and so we we wrote this we wrote this paper. Um, you know, with a question mark, and and I think it actually the, there is a question there. I, I'm 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 not I'm not convinced that we would be able to tell. And there are a number of you know candidate events uh, that have happened in the paleoclimate record that look interestingly like the Anthropocene um and uh and we're, and we're still working on like kind of how exactly like the anthropocene uh they are well uh, but there are some, there are some intriguing things that have happened uh that we don't really have a good characterization of uh in the past and you know if i could jump in so the original paper that you published in april 2018 was entitled the silurian hypothesis would it be possible to detect an industrial civilization in the geological record with a question mark on the end. And it does mention, in fact, near the beginning of it, it starts out talking about the Drake equation, which right. assumes that civilizations, even species, don't last forever. And it also implies that a planet capable of producing intelligent life is probably likely to produce it several times throughout its history, right? So, well, think... yeah. So, so, so the Drake equation is is pretty agnostic about what the terms, uh, you know, what the numerical values of the various terms uh, are. Um, but the uh, but the notion that you know, so so basically, people are calc using it to say, okay, well, here you know, here's a viable planet in a viable zone, and like you know, here here's here's a potential. 
you know, here's the length of the uh, the of a civilization, and that's how long of that life of that planet that we would be able to detect or communicate with those those uh, those aliens. Um, but uh, but if you can have multiple um, uh, multiple uh, civilizations occurring uh, through time uh, on the same planet, well, actually, that just you know maybe maybe. Maybe you can have multiple civilizations that, that that all exist for multiple thousands of years, or or, or even longer, and so that that extends um, the the potential for um, coming across uh, uh, intelligent species uh, elsewhere. So it's not a huge it's not a huge difference uh, to the odds, uh, but it but it does increase it by um, by by uh, you know a factor of you know how, how many how many how many civilizations could you fit on the history of one habitable planet it's yeah I, well, I mean, it's it's uh, that's obviously an open question but i think I, I i don't know that you would automatically assume that it has to just be one uh, well so, I, so that so that's uh, that 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 kind of opens up uh, a new set of assumptions that people have to think about when they're talking about the drake equation I want to I want to drop some numbers here for the audience. Um, and I think most people are familiar with these, but just to kind of rehash them, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Life began about 3.7 billion years ago. Dinosaurs appeared 230 million years ago. Primates around 55 million years ago. Um, our immediate ancestors about 5 million years. Tool using humans 2 million years ago. We've had language for about 150,000 years, started building detectable landmarks around 5,000 years ago. And as you mentioned in the paper, our industrial society is only about 300 years old. So in terms of the Silurian hypothesis, there is a ton of room for other intelligent species to have come and gone, essentially. Well, yes. And, and I, I think I think you can... Um... You can kind of constrain it a little bit. I, I you know, there were, there was very little in the way of uh, land biomass um, prior to the Devonian, which is about four hundred million years ago. Uh, so, in the last four hundred million years, uh, you know, there's been, as far as we know, uh, a civilization, uh, a, a, a constructing civilization, and now an industrial civilization uh, for a very very short period of that time, and. There's a lot of space uh, before uh, before us uh, that you know, like intelligence has uh, has has evolved many many times um, uh, on Earth. We have multiple uh, uh, intelligent species uh, now uh, that have got very diverse uh, and divergent uh, evolutionary backgrounds. Uh, octopuses and crows, you know, I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, they're, they're very, they're very distinct. Um, and so, so intelligence per se is not a rare thing uh, in evolutionary history. Uh, tool use is not a rare thing, uh, even, even among many species uh, today. Uh, and so, you know, how might this have worked out in, in, in different times and different uh, in different environments, it's uh, it, it's an intriguing hypothesis, right? So this is why we this is why we thought about it, and then and then and then we started to think, well, you know, what what would be the the, the signs of an industrial civilization? And and one of the most important, I I, I still think, is um, energy use. So so the ability to harness uh, energy, uh, the most obvious form of energy uh, that exists uh, on earth is is biomass and then fossilized biomass uh, through coal and oil um, and so uh, the burning of that leaves uh, a trace in in the carbon isotopes uh, that we, we're doing right now we, we're changing the the isotopic composition of carbon uh, in the whole system right now because of the addition of all the fossil fuel that we're putting into the uh, uh, into the atmosphere uh, so that seems to be something that might happen. Uh, but then you think about the other things that we're doing, the other the other traces that we're leaving. Uh, you know, we're leaving a a a, a layer of plastic uh, microparticles everywhere in the ocean. We're, we're changing yeah. the chemistry of the ocean. Uh, we're 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 mining uh, metals and putting huge amounts of uh, of, of of gold and uh, selenium and copper uh, into the oceans. And so all of these things are spiking. Um, and we can see 
see similar kinds of things happening uh, in the past. But the things that are very unique to us, to our civilization, like the plastic and the trash and all, you know, you, you, it's not obvious that all civilizations would do that, right? <laughs> um, you know, you well, might think, oh, well, <laughs> other people and, might be more intelligent than us. Uh, so one of the things I think in the paper that you guys did mention was that you were uh, hypothesizing about a civilization, an industrial civilization, similar to ours in many ways. Like you mentioned oil. And I think one of the things in the paper that I noticed was uh, there was the presence of oil there. And I should mention that in the time between this, this hypothetical civilization and ours, those oil deposits would have had time to replenish themselves, right? So yeah. if you had a you know, an oil burning or a coal burning uh, civilization in the past, that would would be here today for us. It would have replenished itself. And I think they've but, hypothesized yeah. that, you know, I mean, so, so, that, so that 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 is that is like a hypothesis on top of a hypothesis. Right. So, yeah, so yeah, the idea yeah. is that one of the things that happens when you um, when you warm up the ocean and uh, and you put tons of carbon into the atmosphere you change the chemistry of the of, of the ocean um and then you're putting lots of nutrients into the ocean that produces uh anoxia uh and so we see uh in previous ever in previous efforts uh in previous events uh that uh, where we see uh, this spike in the carbon isotopes, the global warming, one of the things that comes after that is widespread uh, anoxia, which is uh, oceans that are uh, have been so depleted of oxygen that 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 life uh, really can't uh, can't uh, stand. And then you get a very um, you get a very distinct uh, set of deposits, um, black shale deposits uh, that then end up being, um, you know, the uh, the, the the raw material for shell gas and um, uh, and oil deposits as well and so as part of the overall carbon cycle you might have one can hypothesize um uh you know a species that uses up these deposits uh and then because of the perturbations that they make to the climate system they set up the um uh, the conditions that would then it, many many millions of years later provide more deposits to the next uh the next set of folks that come along so i that's that's a that's an intriguing way in which that could cycle but obviously there's no there's no evidence for that whatsoever yeah, no it's it, it, it the whole thing is incredibly intriguing the <laughs> scales of time that are involved are so vast that's one Absolutely. of the things that excites me and you know again i i should remind the audience that this is entirely hypothetical um you know we, we are not discussing ancient aliens or anything along those lines no. but you know like um historians are currently using ground penetrating radar in the uk to look at ancient settlements that are thousands of years old mm -hmm. but in terms of paleontology um scientists are digging through rock right so that's buried yeah. way down there and as you've mentioned almost everything would be destroyed but to play the devil's advocate there um you know i mean they have found over 700 species of dinosaurs based on fossilized bones mm -hmm. um you know countless more uh petrified you know trees um insects mm -hmm. things along those lines so if this if the society had existed, we probably would have found the occasional, you know, ancient Rolex or something along those lines, right? Maybe, but like you have to, you have to think about how few individuals actually ever get fossilized. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned dinosaurs. So, so the dinosaurs uh, existed for for like a hundred million years um, uh, plus, and given all of the finds that we've had, which are, which are very impressive, um, uh, you can calculate that we've found maybe one dinosaur individual every ten thousand years, ah, okay. across all species. Right? Well. Yeah, so it, that's 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 not a very that's not a very um, uh, that's that's not a very high hit rate. Uh, so most things don't get fossilized. Most things get you know eaten, destroyed, worn away, eroded. Um, and so maybe a good, there's a lot there's a lot more obviously under underneath the surface. But uh, but we have uh, we have a very bad sampling problem. So so the 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 notion that we can just rely on the fact that we found lots of dinosaurs means that we found all important species of dinosaurs. I don't think you can say that, and I don't think you can uh, you you can pin it down uh, really to you know you know a specific uh, period and then feel that you've understood everything that was going on in dinosaur world uh, at, at that point. 
And of course, well, and, the other species apart from dinosaurs. With those time scales, also, uh, you know, right. continents have shifted, coastlines change, sea levels rise. So, you know, modern society is built around the coast. It, in an event like that, I mean, we would be looking in the wrong place. Uh, Mount Everest itself is only 60 million years old. There are right. mountains that are three and a half billion years old. But, you know, I mean, you have massive geologic change. And so, yeah, it, it, I, I would I would definitely agree with you that there has been so much change that you'd have to look at things like ice cores and stuff that has been there. Right. For that so, OK, time, so right? ice cores don't go back far enough. Right. So there's not enough extant ice that goes back beyond perhaps a million years. Mm, uh, so if okay. you're if you're looking at something, you know, from 50 million years ago or 100 million years ago, the only place that you can look uh, really is ocean sediment. Um, and so, but ocean sediment gets reworked as well by, by plate tectonics. And so the number of places where you have ocean sediment that is more than a hundred million years old is actually very few. Uh, so you have, you have shallow deposits on land. Uh, so for instance, there's a lot of, uh, Cretaceous deposits, uh, in, in North America, because that used to be a sea. Um, and then there was a lot of, uh, deposits there and then the sea retreated as, as sea levels, uh, fell and the, and the Rockies were, were built. And so you can still see those, those traces, but, um, uh, but your, your, your ability to see what was going on in the Jurassic, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a very small number of places now amazing amazing um so i you mentioned deoxyg deoxygenation events mm -hmm. um you know you'd mentioned things being laid down like uh temperature changes and events like that there are natural causes for those as well as as potentially artificial ones right? oh yes of course yes Okay. So yeah, for a moment, I was starting to think to myself, hmm, well, I've been approaching this hypothetically, but you know, maybe, maybe there's more, maybe there's more to it. So, uh, you know, one of the interesting things for me is you'd mentioned plastics and pollution. And I think it's important to point out that the legacy of modern industrial society is that that pollution will continue long after humanity is gone. How yes. long do you think that impact will last? Oh, I, I think that there will be traces in the geological record that will uh, effectively last forever. Um, I, you know, people have, a, we, we don't really know uh, how long plastics uh, will stick around in ocean sediment that is, uh, you know, where there's no light, where there's no, you know, UV breakdown of the plastics and things. Uh, it could well be that that lasts effectively forever. Um, we're making, uh, you know, chemical changes uh, to the constituents of, uh, of the ocean, uh, we we can measure those kinds of chemicals um, in sediment that that's a billion years old, and so that that kind of stuff is extremely stable. Uh, so you know we're making our mark geologically on the uh, on the planet, and uh, uh, and it will be there um, you know pretty much uh, forever. I, I I was just I was just in my mind I was thinking about paleontologists digging down and pulling the remnants of an easy bake oven out of a landfill, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, it's not just yeah. plastic bags. I mean, I, 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 you know, pe people, I think, uh, focus too much on objects. And and I think that uh, that's extremely unlikely uh, to be uh, to be how we, we find anything. Um, I think what we're going to find is things that uh, don't require you to be extremely lucky about where you're looking, uh, but are... Um, but are spread globally because, you know, you're affecting the atmosphere, you're affecting the ocean, and it just gets spread everywhere. Um, and so things like the carbon dioxide level that gets spread everywhere, the carbon isotopes get spread everywhere, um, the global warming, it's everywhere, right? So, uh, so, so you're looking for signatures that, that, that get dispersed everywhere so that you don't need to be you know, oh, I just happen to be above a, 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 an ancient civilization's uh, landfill. Uh, you know, the, the chances of that happening is very small, not zero, but, but you know, obviously uh, very small. But if you're looking at something uh, that is that was a global feature of what we're looking for, uh, then it doesn't matter where you go, you, you will find it, right? So, so the chances of you finding something are much greater. Wonderful. Well, Gavin, let me thank you so much for your time. It has truly been a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Let me close by asking, what comes next for you? And do you have any further plans to explore the Silurian hypothesis? Where should we be looking for you and this topic in future headlines? 
So uh, I, I think the, the biggest contribution here has been to see the notion uh, that we could be looking for techno signatures in our past as well as uh, out in space. And I think that uh, if that worked out or something, you know, anomalous was found, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be I'd be astounded. Wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you.